be live. Uh, I'm Giles Torreira, and uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, it's a very particular moment. Very few moments in history where so much of the planet has been so affected by the same event. Massive uncertainty, but also there's a huge amount of opportunity. And as it is our task as artists and actors to reflect the human experience, so we must now be very ready and very prepared to accept that challenge. And especially you as young actors, young students starting out on your journey, it's so important that you are as prepared and equipped and ready as possible. So I got together with Mountain View and I wanted to create an environment where we can all come together, young students, more experienced students, and we can share and talk and challenge each other and exchange ideas. And hopefully you will leave these conversations a bit more um, inspired to answer that challenge. So thank you for joining us. I hope you and yours are very well. Uh, our guest this week, very excited about, she is a two-time Olivier Award winner. She is a Tony nominee. She has performed extensively at the National Theatre and the Royal Shakespeare Company. She was on the Board of Governors at the Royal Shakespeare Company for many years. She is an associate artist here at Mount View, and she is one of the funniest people I have ever worked with. Uh, so I'm very excited for you to meet my friend, Noma Dumazweni. Hi, Hi, Noma. Hello, my baby. How are you? All right, my doll. Good to see you. There you are. The funniest people. I went, oh, yeah, I know what you're talking about, the backstage stuff. That's what he's talking about. <laughs> we, had fun. Fun. we had we fun. We had fun. Uh, we did a play together and we had fun. How yeah. are you? You're, you're there in America, I think. I am. I am in New York. It is now just gone five past one in the afternoon. And um, me, my child is online schooling in her bedroom. I think she's on the science. Yes, one o'clock is science time. Okay, cool. So we're all good. We, we are, our students um, are very excited that you're here with us. God bless you, of, and you and all who sail in her. That's they've got a lot, of, a lot of questions. Okay. Uh, I, I wanted to ask a few questions to begin with. Cheers on, what is that, wine? You've got wine? Yeah. Perfect, perfect. Oh, it's wine. Perfect. We're not um, yeah. We're like, <laughs> I have some questions and then mm -hmm. I'm going to open it out to some of our students' questions. Love so that. if you're ready, we'll go. Yeah. Okay. Maybe for you. It's very serious. Um, okay. Where were you born, Noma? So I was born in a place called Ilatikulu in Swaziland, now um, Isitwani is a, a name change that came through, I think, about three, four years ago. Um, what, previously known as Swaziland. My parents are from South Africa. So it was on a journey that they had. I was born along the journey because my sister was next born in Botswana. And where did you go to school? Oh, I went to school in Suffolk. So a lot of my, yes, there were loads of schools in between because my family traveled a lot. So I would say from Swaziland to Botswana, to Kenya, to Uganda, to Ipswich and Felixstowe. For those who know, they know, it's a different world. And I kind of joke and say that one day, if I ever write an autobiography, it shall be called From Africa to Ipswich, because everything. <laughs> anyway, so but my point being, being that uh, school for me, memory-wise, is um, Ipswich, St. John's Primary School, Felixstowe, Orwell High School in Suffolk. And how did you get from Orwell to, I want to say, Wolsey Theatre Company? Oh my God, thank God for the Wolsey Youth Theatre. Right Youth at that Theater. time, huh? The Wolsey Youth Theatre. The Wolsey Youth Theatre, which is now, I understand the theatre is now called the New Wolsey Theatre, but at the time that I was growing up, it was a Wolsey Theatre run by a gentleman called Anthony Tucky. We all knew him as Dick Tucky. I still have to figure out what that, but it was Dick. Dick Dick was there and he was amazing. And I will always have um, a soft spot in my heart for that man and what he ran on Sunday afternoons. And it was via a friend saying, um, do you 
want to come to this. I can't quite remember how it worked out. It, it was either my mum going, you need to do something while um, I'm working, just find something to do, or it was a friend saying, come along. But at the age of 13, I discovered the Walls of Youth Theatre. And I've said numerous times that it felt like I changed my life because I finally met my tribe in terms of a crowd of people who were not great academically, but enjoyed having fun and enjoyed making stories. And you go, oh, I don't have to use that head just solely, but I can use my body. I can use um, my sounds. I can use my, how I play. It's all about playing. I much prefer playing um, than sitting there. And what kind of things did you do? What kind of productions would you do? Um, oh gosh, I, because what was great about it, you also had loads of people who were in the stage management uh, department. Um, I, all my oldest friends, and I mean that, all my, the friends I still keep in touch with today are from the youth theatre. I don't know anybody still from school. Yes, maybe the Joe Davis I still know and get in touch with, but everyone else is um, from the youth theatre. But I remember there's Sally Jones who worked on the stage department, uh, stage management department, who went on to become a stage manager. There's Caitlin and Harriet, we're all doing the um, theatre bit, Ian, um, Cole, uh, so many people I'm going to say forget I can't remember of course I can't remember names right now but those are the friends that I hold closest that I've mentioned right now um that we're still friends I was only talking to Harriet last week about this wild world we're in and how mm. how we've traversed it from that time but that was a group of people and that was an experience my first show at the Wolsey Theatre was the princess and the swineherd and I believe if I remember correctly I played the queen mother that's what I remember. That figures. And I've played a lot of Queen Mothers ever since. And I will hopefully carry on playing a lot of Queen Mothers. <laughs> Dotage, yes. How did you go? Did you go to drama school? This is what I like sharing with everybody now that I understand why I like sharing it. I didn't go to drama school. Um, I had a problem that I didn't go to drama school at a certain time. But now, as people say, when things like that happen is that, oh, that was my superpower to a certain extent that I didn't go to drama school. Um, I auditioned for two years in a row and I didn't get in. Um, worked for a PR company. Where, for a huh? Where did you audition? So I didn't audition for Mount View. <laughs> I didn't audition for Mount Are you saying that I should have thought about that? No. Because I would never have forgiven Mount View if they'd passed if you had me up. <laughs> no, the irony, the irony. I, I do remember, I remember from Drama Center and the RADA getting, uh, if people drop out, we're going to put you on that list. Um, right. Kind of listing. So that was, that was positive. Um, uh, I did Central, I did Guildhall. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm trying to remember. I think there were about four or five of them that I did specifically going, that's what I want to do. And didn't get in, didn't get in. And then went, well, okay, then I won't do it. Worked for two years in a PR company, uh, which was amazing. Got to know like the fashion designers and all the music. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Yo, yo, yo. And enjoyed all that side of it. Then got made redundant. And I was so shocked, just like me. I thought I was marvelous in this job. Oh, you don't want me? <laughs> um, so let me set up the relationship of how acting is because you have to be rejected and you figure out how you're going to make it work so after that one of the it was workshops it was the city lit doing script reading it was um, uh, Jackson's Lane Dexter Fletcher and his brothers ran a, a an improv class which was amazing and a lot of the people there were via, had come via Anna Scher, um, who was a great educator for children's theatre or child actors. Um, and so I'm meeting all these people in my 20s and they're in their like 20s as well. So we were, so from Suffolk to London coming in, that's what it felt like. I'm talking about Jackson's Lane specifically. That was great. That was great. That was great. Because there were so many different types of people there, which I really, and I mean representation wise, um, which I really appreciated. So yeah, that's what I remember. Okay, so a question that I was going to come to, but we could touched on now is how well, you kind of touched on it is how you manage to deal with the disappointments or dealing with the rejection dealing with not getting that job not getting that part um how do you how do you personally cope with those kind of disappointments i'm, I'm going to only talk about now the present time how i cope with them now i mean all the present time in the last 10 years um it's expectations let go of expectations and those disappointments 
won't hurt as much. What I do know is that if, as long as I go in to an audition, having understood why I'm going into an audition, um, what does that mean? I've got to be clear I'm going, right, so I've got this moment, I've got this five minutes, and this is the script I've been given, what do they want? My big thing, I really appreciate, I think a lot of you actors should um, hold this to yourself, is that, it's, I, I can't remember where I read it, but it's that thing that you could be the one who makes the difference. So don't go in there on your back foot, but go in there present and going, okay, I've done my work, let's see how this feeds for you. I will also ask questions. I like asking questions of the director, of the casting director again. So what is it you want? What, what is needed? What else can I add to what I'm already doing? I am very, very aware now that I'm in New York, having done the Harry Potter here, talking to actors over here, they do it in a different way. They do it in a way that scares the bejesus out of me. Because, cool. because they just audition. They have no chance to talk to the directors or the um, casting directors on the very first call. They have to, hi, bye, thank you, go. I'm like, what? No, 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 my good work comes in the talking. My good work comes in the talking, then I can give you more. Um, and I always joke to my friends going, I don't think I would have been uh, a successful actor if I'd grown up, grown up in this paradigm and how you go about getting work. But in terms of uh, London, having chats, I really appreciate. So what I'm trying to say is that the disappointments, especially now is I, I need to know why I'm doing it. I need to know why I'm going up for it. I need to know what, what I'm curious about it for. Um, the biggest thing, especially anyone starting out is that feeling of desperation going, I need to get this, I need to get this because I can pay my bills. I've got something da, da, da. It's when it becomes about the bills and living um, and not about the work, that's when things get messy that's when it gets a bit painful because it is that cliche thing. You're not doing it from your, um, you're not doing it for the story. You're not there for the storytelling. You're there going, what if, what if, what if, as opposed to being present. So stop being what if and be present. Cause I've done the what if and it's messed me up. I've not, I've not done well there. The jobs that I was going, why didn't I get that? I should have got that. Shoulda, woulda, coulda, yada, yada, yada. <laughs> what when you started working professionally was it what you expected it would be no what do i mean by that um i think when i started working compared to let's let's put it this way i would say it's 25 years since i officially professionally started working um quickly just gonna add to that uh, not going to drama school thing, which is going to come back to this question, um, is that I have a mentor. He is 83 years old. I met him 25 years ago when I was 25. And because I didn't do drama school, that man was my saving grace and is still my saving grace because he's the one who said, no, you can do it. It's a gentleman called Anthony Singleton, who was uh, an actor uh, in the 60s, 70s, 50s, 60s, 70s. And at that point I met him as a teacher and we clicked and he is now one of my very, very best friends. I can say this 83 year old man is absolutely one of my very best friends. And he was the one who said, no, you can do this and we'll just work together. And I remember asking him, should I try and audition for drama school again? And I think at this point it was about um, two years after the last one. So it would have been a four year gap. He said, well, you've been doing loads of stuff in between. Um, why don't we just keep working and just see how it goes. And via him, I got my first theater job. Now I just realized I was saying, I'm gonna come back to your question. What was your question again there, Giles? <laughs> how, my question was, yeah. was, it, was the profession what you expected when you started so, working? Yeah, so when I started working, so coming back to so my first job was in a, in a um, uh, Viatown, it, it was a pub gig. Um, in, uh, oh, where was it? It's up north, it was near Camden. And um, being the only black person in that company, that, that was good because there was an amazing guy called Christopher Geelan who runs um, uh, Shakespeare for kids, him and his family do. And I think his grown daughter, Martha now, who was not born when I was working with Christopher, um, runs that show. And um, that was an ex that, that was a wonderful experience working with Christopher because it was working on a um, uh, it was women beware women um, 
going, my head's going, I can't remember. Other people know the classics very well and that's good. I'm glad you do. Um, but I, that experience was fantastic um, because of Christopher Geelan and the people I worked with, but I was the only person of color. And, um, but I got to play Bianca and it was a learning curve because it's like, oh shit. I, I remember one night losing my lines, at, at tripping over and then coming up off going mortified but it was a beginning of learning let it go keep moving let it go keep moving yeah um but in terms of if you're talking the business business are we talking about being a person of color because that's what we are or we're talking about the arts because that's what we are are we talking about um the 80s 90s because that's what i know you're younger than me but that's that's what do you mean it's all about time and space so uh, yeah but when i for instance, when i started working yeah it was, it felt like a continuation of what had happened at drama school. So you go in every day and you're in rehearsals and then you kind of do the thing. And then if you're not doing that play, you're doing that play, you're doing that production. So when I left, I was at the National we were in rep. So we were doing, rehearsing a play in the morning and then doing another one in the afternoon. And then you performed the musical in the evening whilst rehearsing. So it was all, it felt exactly like drama school. So, so, for me, that sounds romantic, so romantic. Yeah, so growing yeah. up watching all the movies when I was a kid, it was like, oh, you're making a show, kids, you're making a show. Yeah, but it was, but so it felt very similar. And then mm. after that, I started working and I was like, oh no, this, it, it, how it is in the real world isn't like it was at drama school. There was a big, there was a shift where I had yeah. to kind of go, okay, right, this is how it works. Um, so I just wanted to know on that level, like what, on all what? of it, I guess, for what me, thing? in terms of professionally, professionally, yeah. I got my first professional job in 1992. I always remember this because it was when the equity card popped through the door. Yeah. After I'd done a theatre and education gig. And my very good friend, still a great friend of mine, Lisa Goldman, um, directed that gig and then got me on to do another gig but she fought for me which is what I found out because I didn't have any experience I didn't have any drama school experience so it was that catch 22 about getting your equity card you need experience to get the equity card but you have to get the equity card to get experience um and it was interesting because I went all right so I'm going to do a theatre and education gig that's it but there was a level for me which I always felt that because I hadn't gone to drama school I just couldn't seem to get past or through everyone else seemed to understand and this is why I talk about what I thought was going on everyone else seemed to know something else that I didn't I, I didn't understand that and it wasn't until working with an older actor on a gig in Edinburgh taking one of those doing one of those shows at 11 o'clock show in the morning so we were out <laughs> at six o'clock in the morning handing out the flyers Say again, it's exhausting. Have you done it? It's all building, it's building. It, it, that makes you who you are doing those. It gigs. does, but have you done the Edinburgh experience? Yeah, did it once, yeah. Yeah, well, <laughs> was once enough. <laughs> it was great, it was great. We had a, we had a good show, um, like it was, uh, they did really well with marketing, so we didn't have to walk down the Royal Mile handing out flyers and stuff, so we didn't have to do that. And I kind of feel a bit cheap, I would have liked, I think that's part of it. You know, you know, you know the value of your audience if yeah. you have to go in and convince them to come into the theatre and see your production. You so. really do. You really do. That's very, very true. That's very, very true. And then doing an 11 o'clock show in the morning. Oh, I did do it again. I did do the uh, Edinburgh again later on at the Travellers, which was a different experience. But it's it's just it, uh, working on that show. The old, uh, an older actor said to me, so where did you go to drama school? I, I, I didn't go to drama school. I felt ashamed. I went, oh, darling. Oh no, that's not a problem. It's perfect. You're doing it on the job. You're yeah. doing it on the job. I was like, oh yeah, because he wanted to explain because we all have to start somewhere. We have all this playtime and and then we go out into the world and then we yeah. have to start all over again. And I just do remember Bernard saying that and I just went, yes, of course. Yeah. I'm just doing it a different route. I'm just doing yeah. it a different route is all I can yeah. say. Yeah. We're still going to meet the same shit is all I can say. Absolutely. <laughs> But I hear you because I had a thing where I didn't, my parents, none of my family were in the theatre, so we didn't yeah. go to the theatre, we couldn't afford to go to the theatre. We saw, we saw like um, movies every now and again, the cinema. Thank but we God didn't for movies. The theater. Thank God for movies, yes. Thank God for movies. But so when I came to drama school, it was similar, where I felt like everyone knows about Chekhov and they know about Pinter, and they know about Oscar Wilde and they know about all this stuff. And I have no idea about any of it. No. And it kind of it's gave me... Yeah, but yeah, I know it. Of course, you're like, 
you don't want to let on that you don't know about any of that stuff. <laughs> but that stage, oh my God, can we just hold this moment, this not letting go? Can I just big, big out, because you're going to finish this, but go out to those students who are all starting out. Stop hiding your stuff. Stop pretending. Be honest that you don't know stuff. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's true. That's what it's for, because the, soon, the sooner you admit that, the sooner you learn stuff. There but you go. Beautiful. What it gave me is it always gave me a thing. I always felt like I was catching up. It kind of get when I started working, it, it, I always felt like I was a little bit behind everyone in terms of yeah. what they knew. So it yeah. kind of the positive side, it kind of gave me a bit of a hunger to to always to be curious and to learn. Yeah. yeah. So I was wondering whether you had the step whether it your always. version gave you a My similar. version of that is every job. And I know that actors I've worked with in the past will agree with this. I'm like <gasps> What's new? What's new? What am I going to learn? I mean, let's go to the job that we did together at the National, what I call the walking, not talking show. It was the first, because it, no, it was the hour we knew nothing of each other by Peter Hanker, directed by James McDonald, a cast of... 30, 30 maybe? Yeah. 30, but we all had roughly, the 30 actors all had roughly minimum of 10 parts each. Yeah. And it was a movement piece but it was not a movement piece. It's an extraordinary piece of theatre. And it's the one piece of theatre which I found extraordinary in the Littleton that at the end of uh, the show, in our curtain call, one corner would be going, boo, boo. <laughs> and the others would be going, woo, bravo, bravo. I was like, yeah. oh, this is theatre. Yeah. Every job exactly. gives me something new. And we had, that was a learning curve, that one. That was amazing. Yeah. That was yeah. amazing. It was, it was, that, that was definitely, the rehearsals were much more interesting than the actual doing of it. Yes. Yes, this is very, uh, yes, it was. It was very hard because there was no talking. There was no dialogue. Yes. So it was essentially silent backstage. It was yes. Yeah, it was, it was silent the whole time. Um, so every what? job is something new. So that's what I'm trying to say. Every job I find, and still to this day, it's like, what is it? What is it? What, what else can I learn? Do you know where, your storytelling ability comes from within your family. Can you trace it back? Were there storytellers? I'm sure there are. Um, I've, ooh, even just thinking about Mama, not really. We like, no. I mean, that sense of you saying there, were no, there was no one in my family who did this thing. That's the same for me. But I think what my mum clocked very early on is that I would love listening to stories that came via the TV. She clocked that very early on. She says, you were about three when, you, when I first saw TV. And I was like, and I was like, you just trying to hustle to stay more and more because I love stories, I love movies. I've got to get a tissue. Just hold a second. Excuse me, just a second. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I also love language, but it's not that I love... I love how people tell a story. So growing up, saying someone watching someone like Danny Kay in uh, in King Arthur's Court, or um, you know the Pestle with the Vessels, and do you know that one? The pe All that stuff, that rhythm playing. You go, he's amazing. Danny Kay's amazing, and he can sing, and he can dance, and he's a comedy guy. Well, look at all the chaplains. So just using what's around you. You go, oh, I'm drawn to that. Because I'm, I'm watching my 13 year old at the moment going, I don't quite know what she's drawn to, excuse me. And, uh, but I know she's drawn to dancing. I know she's drawn to music a lot. So I'm kind of going, all right, let's, where's that going to go? Where's that going to go? Because I think we find what we need for yes. us all to come out. So in terms, and therefore the other side of that, my mum was very open about going, right, go on. Yeah, go do that, go do that, enjoy that. We'll come watch that. I remember persuading her, can I please go and watch Grease, the movie? Please. <laughs> like, oh, oh. And then she buckled. And it was like the best thing for me and my sister. It was like little things like that. Cause I think of that was cinema, single mom, not sure she could afford it. And it's supposed to be growing up. She'd heard about it, but didn't know anything. But I remember going to watch Grease when they came out of the movies. <laughs> that's extraordinary. Yeah, that's how well, the, reason, the reason I ask is because <laughs> at, here at Mountain View, as you know, we try really hard to reach out into communities and areas that don't necessarily have the clearest route through to drama training or professional acting or theatre in London or whatever. That's so brilliant! It's in Peckham. I'm sorry when when the changeover because I love I know yeah. the agency. Right. Like, 
So it's, it's very, very important to us to kind of find people who might not necessarily think that theatre is for them yeah. unless they are told and given those opportunities and shown. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's very interesting, you know, to make a distinction between, oh, I know people who are professional actors or whatever, or actually we all have people in our families who are storytellers, who are dancers, who are great singers. There's always that uncle who gets up at Christmas and always sings. And he's not a singer, but he's got this amazing voice. I, I think it's interesting to sort of for us to say, actually, you are a performer. You are yeah. a storyteller, regardless of what yeah. you, what society sort of tells you you are. Um, so I think it's always very interesting to sort of look back. Exactly. And, even and how you the, drawn to it, and also see where you were drawn to it, because in terms of that, yeah. you didn't have the big family, but you kind of go, oh, but I love listening to tales. I yes. love listening to comedians. I mean, I'm, you don't know this person, and most probably you don't, a lot of you don't. Like Bob, Holt, Bob Hope and Abbott and Costello, and um, yeah. you, there was just a whole, uh, I'm trying to remember these old movies where you just went, they're just making me laugh. I just love their turn of phrase. Yeah. But whatever that thing is in you, it's, you're watching around, there is that family member who, who could be performing and there's not a performer. There is you who loves to go, can I, can I please read this story? Please, can I, please, can I, please, can I read this story? I think I meant <laughs> a little bit of that in me. I'm, I think I meant a lot in me, yeah. So you talked about me your mentor. Yes. Who's now in his 80s. You, you, it, it's obviously really important to you to help and encourage young artists, young yeah. actors. Why? What I know now, why? Because I was talking to a friend about this. I see my story, my life story in terms of, um, oh, wow, that wasn't expected. I was not. I've just done a show on Broadway. I was not, five, 10 years ago, I was not expecting to be doing a show on Broadway. So why I want to support, why I always want to support, at the very least hear stories, at the very least um, have a conversation with you just to see how you're feeling. Actor, younger, and when we say young actors, I also have to add also those people who are taking the risk of changing their world uh, after working in a, an environment for 10 years and going, no, I really want to do the acting. And let's say emerging and new um, uh, performers, storytellers, and it doesn't matter what that, that age is, mm -hmm. um, because I just want to be part of that. I want to be part of the route that says, it doesn't have to be just this way. There are other ways of doing it. So my support, for Mount View came out of a love because people talked to me who were involved with uh, Mount View and I was like, that's great. But I have, a, a, I have a relationship with different drama schools in different levels. And I didn't go to drama school and that's fine because I'm going, actually I've spoken to enough young people go, I've auditioned five times in a row. And I kind of go, well, do you need to do that? Does it need to be that way? Maybe you have to think about it in a different way um, or keep trying. You can, you can see that you're stronger than me and keep pushing. So it's about conversation more than anything. That's what it feels like when I'm trying to support people. It's like, because actually you and I are totally different stories from the people who are watching. And, and, and again, I always go, the individual, you, the story, I'm trying to look into the camera going, you, you are, <laughs> you're the only version of you that exists, blah, blah, blah. And I've said this so many times, you are the fingerprint, you are the snowflake, please understand that. There is only one of you in this world, how you go about that and the choices you make and it's totally and utterly yours, you have to take responsibility for. So the people you choose to play with in all various ways and manners um, are the ones that are gonna make you tell the story of your life. And I can only look at the story of my life now going, wow, okay, not bad, not bad. I've still got some time to go. Some people may think it's over, I still have, a lot of dreams and I'm sure you do as well my darling yeah 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 oh yes um hopefully we'll get to play some of those up it, who knows um know. Harry Potter you just mentioned yes okay, where, did, that, did I just you, mention Harry Potter yeah bong. uh how do you uh <laughs> how do you start where do you start with a character or oh, okay so let's take Hermione but also let's take say Cleopatra which was you've also played where do you start with a character? Like, I still have to play her. Can I just put that out there? I still have to play Cleopatra. And I'm Why do I play Cleopatra? Huh? Why again? not always you play Cleopatra? 
Because it should be. I should have played it. <laughs> <laughs> it's the right fit. Of Wheel. course. Okay, let's do it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Come on. We'll with with any part that you get, where yeah. do you start? Oh, jeez. Your creative it, process. My create. I realise, and I. <laughs> I used to go, why don't I have a creative process? I don't seem to have a formalised, disciplined, disciplined creative process. Oh, because I'm not formal, I'm not disciplined. I am literally, I arrive in the room, have a look around, who am I playing with? And interestingly enough for me, what I've absolutely, absolutely acknowledged about myself now, and it goes into everything, it's not, it's weird enough, it's not the play. I'm not interested in the play. The play is about third or fourth down the list out of 10. It's about number three, number four. I'm interested in who's playing and who's directing. That's what I know now. 25 years ago, it's like, yeah, 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 whatever. What's the play? Okay, who's playing? And then you learn, oh, that, that person's way of working doesn't suit me. I don't, it, it, it makes me feel small. Um, but this person's way makes me feel really good. So I'm much more, how does this person work? Why do they want to do this? Why, why, why do I want to be in the room with them? So let's say John Tiffany, who directed Harry Potter, and Stephen Hoggart, who did the movement. Um, the year previously, I'd finally did a workshop with them um, at the Royal Court, which was joyous, had great fun, and then was called up to come and do this workshop, which no one knew, a year later, no one knew about. And then you found out it's, it's Harry Potter when you're in the room. You go, okay. Harry Potter, they're doing Harry Potter the stage show. Why would you do that? But Harry, but, but Harry Potter being done is being done by John Tiffany and Stephen Hogger and Jack Thorne. Um, Colin Callender is producing, Sonia Friedman is producing, Christine Jones is designing, um, Gareth Fry is doing the sound, um, Neil Austin's doing the lighting. You kind of go, okay, okay, these are interesting people to be in a room with. So yes, I'm very happy to do the workshop. And then the actors love actors. I love actors. I do, I love actors. I'm an actor. I'm glad, I'm glad. I can tell that. You're kind of and crazy. The they're bringing in, you go, oh my God, there's Poppy Miller. Oh my God, that's Paul Thorne. I've seen him before. Yeah, yeah, okay, Alex Price. And who are these young ones? I have no idea who these young ones are, but they're fabulous. So that for me, and then you go, so therefore my process is ultimately, what would the director like? And can I service that? How would you like to go about it? One thing I do know about myself very much is I do not like sitting around a table for too long. Okay. I, um, a, a week is good. Two weeks drives me crazy. Um, uh, or mix it up, mix it up. If, uh, let's do two days in the week and then everything else, um, put it on its feet. So basically I'm trying to say, I have no, I know that mine's chaotic and it will, I'll throw it to the wall. And if we play and we dance and, oh, we start getting a nice rhythm, then we're all creating something together is the answer to how my process is. <laughs> can, you, can you name three yeah. people without whom Noma, the actress, would not be here? And can you say how they influenced you? Okay, first and foremost, Anthony Singleton. My mentor, 83 year old. So I'm, I'm just looking at my daughter, child, what, what, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> you hear that noise? I know it's always... Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Sorry, close. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. You're done. I'm going to carry this on. This is lockdown. This is life, life in lockdown. Totally live. Um, uh, Anthony Singleton, first and foremost. Um, Greg Doran at the Royal Shakespeare Company, because he is the person who brought me into the Royal Shakespeare Company. I remember auditioning and not getting a gig. Um, but I'd, I'd, that year I'd read uh, The Year of the King uh, with, uh, by Anthony Sher, who was Greg's partner. So I remember going out for this audition for a play called Orinoco, who a lot of um, uh, actors of our age will know at that time was it being done at the ROC. And um, I get called to go meet Greg and I'm just so excited to be at the RSC for a start. I'm just so excited that I finally, finally got an audition at the RSC after years of writing and I've never been brought in. Um, because that's another thing that happens, guys. You want to get, and it's, it's just not in your uh, 
timing at that moment. So this happened to be, they were already, they'd already started rehearsals and they were looking for one tiny part. And I felt as if it was like, oh, can we just bring in people we haven't seen? That's what I always felt the story was. Can we just bring in people we haven't seen? <gasps> Great, I get, I get to audition for Greg and I've just read Anthony Scherzberg, so that's, I know that they're partners and all that. And this lovely long haired man with a beard, just, just sweetheart, didn't get the job. I was so gutted. <laughs> and then uh, three months later, I got the phone call via the agents at the time saying, Greg Dorland would like to speak to you. And he was saying, I didn't give you that job then because I knew this was coming up. And it was doing, um, oh, I'm at home, I can say it. I was doing Macbeth. I'm one of those who says Macbeth, the Scottish. Yes, I can say it. Yeah, I can say it. It's fine. Oh, I love it. You're moving. How are you? I have to because I, I have to because my, my battery is, is correct. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> so brilliant. Yeah, yeah, so live. Yeah. So live. I love it. And the music, you'll always have music, Giles. Look at you. Even the yeah. yeah. No, 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 don't look at that. Don't look at that. Oh, I don't, just, don't look at that. I love it. You're just angling that. Um, and basically he said, look, I, I I remember you from that audition, and I want you, and I didn't want to give you that job because this was coming up, and it was um Macbeth with Harry Walter and Anthony Sher playing the Macbeths and uh, do you want to be one of the witches? Yes, please I do. Yes, please I do. And I finally got to work with the Royal Shakespeare Company at the age of 30. I remember that my, my 30th birthday was in that time. And um, I loved it. I was like a little kid. Uh, growing, growing time. Uh, I met um, bullying for the first time. I met absolute creativity for the first time. It's the first time I'd ever been in a company, an institution like that. So you're trying to find your way. It's the first time I'd ever worked with a hierarchy of who the leading actors were and going down to the spear carriers. I was like, oh, right. Okay. So my years of working in um, fringe theatre, pubs, and um, let's come on, kids, let's make a show with a t-shirt and a book or something like that. But now you've got different departments able to do things. So that was a huge learning curve. So Greg Doran, Anthony, um, uh, Anthony Singleton, my first mentor. Um, so uh, Greg for bringing me there. And also, I'm just trying to think Michael Boyd in a different way, who was the next um, who was the artistic director at the Royal Shakespeare Company. Yeah, I love you, Michael. It's not. It's not. I've got to. I've got to think because that third position, I could split it between about five people. And Michael okay. Said, well, no, you yeah. can't. I'm afraid. Ah. <laughs> oh. Okay. Because fine. Come think back. about this job is you don't do it on your own. You don't. None of this you do on your own. And the different shifts and levels of time and space that I cannot. Going. Oh, so and so did that. And I could say, an agent, Cassie Mayer before my agent now, before they closed shop, was a pivotal moment for me when I got Cassie, because that's the time I got the um, RSC. And it was extraordinary, so that all seemed to fit in. Yeah, I'll put those three and Cassie may. Okay, good. Now I'm going to hand over to the most important people, which are the, our students. Please. Because they're very, very excited and they've got some good questions. So I want to ask okay. some of those. Okay, this one is from Amelia. Okay. Hello, Amelia. Says, when, when approaching a script, we've kind of touched on this. When approaching a script, what is your own process before the beginning, before beginning work in rehearsal rooms? And what do you can, what do you do to continue to explore when you're working on the text in the room? Um, more often than not, before the beginning of work in the rehearsal rooms, read the play. Read the play. Read the thing, read the thing, read the thing. Um, but don't make any judgment of it. Read the first um, reading of it is just let it hit you. Um, and I say read it up to three times, ideally more than that, but I'm not, I know other friends who read over and over and over again. Oh, three is my max because I actually, I want to read it, see that how the hit takes me and then read it again when you're concentrating on the part that you've got. Uh, and then, Ideally, then the next read for me is the rehearsal read because then I want to see how the director is doing it. So that ultimately read the story, know the story you're walking into and write the questions, the things that don't make sense to you in your script. This is from Tyre Rose. What are the constant struggles you face in the industry as a black woman? Oh. <laughs> I mean, it's really interesting. That's not an answer, I'm afraid, Gnomes. <laughs> no, I know. It's really interesting because I would say 25 years ago, they were a totally different thing to now. But Okay, give us both. But, 
but I'm saying this and, and, and I'm also saying that from a, a, absolutely a position of privilege right now. So Tyra Rose, I am going to say that you're a young black woman. Um, and I will go back to that thing I said, there is only one Tyra Rose that you know of and there's only one Tyra Rose that, that, that exists like you. Hold on to that first and foremost. What I love about my friend Sherelle Skeet, you know, the gorgeous Sherelle, and um, her friend, um, oh, forgive me, Charlene, forgive me if I got that wrong, but she, they co-founded the Black Tris, um company, which is specifically for young black, oh, for black female um, actresses. And it's a, it's a place of seeing yourself because more often, I don't know what the makeup is of the year or, or the years at, at Mountview are right now, but growing up when I did and becoming an actor and getting to know the other female actors of color, you realize that you were the only one. You, were, I was at that year of um, 30 year old doing Shakespeare, I was the only black woman in that company. So that's a company of like 20 people. So that does something to you. You're the only one of yourself that you see. Um, look for your tribes, look for your people. If they're not in drama school, if they're not in the place that you're working, um, seek out your friends, seek out, seek yourself out, which I didn't have that from Suffolk to London. But when you, when you go, this is a job I want, you will see it coming through and you go, do I like that person? Forget their color, but do I like that person? Is that person good for me? Will I learn something well? And can I reciprocate as well? Uh, that, person, that person's experience of their life. Um, my big thing is, because I have been, and I'm saying this, because I have been a victim of, oh, woe is me, why is this not working? Our world is shifting. And I think Tyra Rose, you're in this wonderful, wonderful space that there are groups of us, there are groups of you, there are groups of young people going because of social media, because of YouTube, because of how we communicate, um, that you're not on your own, that there are people uh, close by you and you could be the leader of this, making uh, space for you to come together and talk. Um, and I think that's really important. So that's why I, I would big up Sherelle on, uh, with Black Dress. And um, yes, and Charlene, but she's not there, but Sherelle and Shiloh right there. Okay. Yeah. If you, this is from Lois. If from you Lois. could work with any actor, this is from Lois. Lois. Mulvana. Okay. Oh. If you could work with any actor or actress, dead or alive, who would you work with and why? Oh my God. Oh. Okay. <laughs> That's a huge list. I don't, oh. Dead or alive. Dead or alive. Okay, Marilyn Monroe. I would want to see what that was like. I would want to see what that was like in the room. That thing of that magic, how she could turn it on, turn it off. Cause I'm always fascinated by that in all actors and all creative storytellers. Um, uh, I would love to have met, but she's not an actress, but I would love to have met um, Miriam Makeba in, in a situation. She was a South African singer who was exiled for a very long time, just to speak to her about that journey. And as a child of exile in a different time and space is what I'm talking about. Um, oh my God. How, oh, that's two, that's that's two people. Huh? Sorry? That's, that's, that's someone, that's, that's an answer. That's who an answer. Yeah, okay, they're, they're loads, but that's, I would not limit it. I, could, I couldn't limit it because it's there for you. I mean, I'm watching loads of comedy at the moment and comedy is great in times like this. Just seek out the comedy wherever you can is all I can say. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm loving it. So someone like say Jerry Seinfeld, I think is amazing. Yeah. Chappelle, I think is amazing. So I'm, I'm not gonna answer. It's whoever makes you feel good in the moment. Okay, this is from Caitlin. Any tips on how actors can keep creativity flowing and how we could further our learning while in lockdown. So, that's an interesting one. I like that question. Um, old question is great, but that's a really, because it's, it's, it, it's one that goes to when you're not working as an actor, how do you keep your creativity flowing? So before lockdown, I would say to people, 
go and work as a volunteer in uh, in a shop somewhere that a secondhand shop. So you, you can meet people, experience that different world of not you. The more you can get out of your head, the better I think the world will be creatively for you. And this is coming from someone who can very much be in her head in life and also on stage sometimes, which is, that's when I know it's not working for me. Um, in this time of lockdown, I will go back to that thing. I'm loving the time to explore um, TV and film. I'm doing loads of TV, watching loads of TV, because in my head it's like, well, that's my job, isn't it? I've got to do a bit of research. <laughs> Great, um, can't get anywhere. So whatever's coming out at the moment is amazing. So, uh, but my thing is comedy. So I'm doing loads and loads of comedies at the moment. So, um, uh, because there are people, there's some people I do not know. So forget that's that's. Sorry, I'm not answering your question very well. Um, how do you keep yourself creative on a day to day basis? Cook. Do you like cooking? Does tidying up make you feel really well? Does that make you feel really good? Does literally shifting the room around, shifting the pictures around in your room make you feel good? I'm always, for any kind of creativity, I'm always going, if you're in a stuck place, what's the thing today in this moment that will make you feel better? And as um, uh, mindful speakers say, what's the better feeling thought? in this moment go for the better feeling thought if that means I really fancy custard pudding on top of a cake go go do it but don't judge yourself don't beat yourself up about it drawing just see where it goes paint I, I literally bought paint yesterday because me and the girl have been going we've got to do something I mean I'm loving the tv but now I need to use this because also using this making this hitting this yeah. something does yeah. something though it's known that it does something it's connected to your brain how you the mind works if you don't use your hands yes it's, there's a there's a lack there's a lack that goes on in the body there's a lack that opens up so even knitting we've started knitting recently again it's great we've had it like, oh yeah let's do knitting she's knitting i'm knitting it's great it sounds so simplistic but that's the beauty of it go for the thing that makes you feel good in this moment in time the, the interesting thing I think I find about this question yeah. is that she says um, how you can further your learning and keep creativity in lockdown. And yeah. it strikes me that like there's this atmosphere that we have of such massive uncertainty, which is quite, it's very, very stressful for a lot of people because especially our students, they're training yeah. and they're saying, well, hang on a minute, what's the industry going to be like when we go out there? Are we when coming we back? Yeah, what, how is it going to be? Yes. So I, so I was wondering, that sort of brings me around to sort of general well-being. Yeah. It strikes me that a lot, the, a lot of the students I speak to um, have seemed to have far more pressures or susceptible to the pressures um, than I had when I was graduating 20 years ago. Because at that point, you didn't have social media. You didn't have any of that stuff. You didn't yeah. have to worry didn't about it. Yeah, I'm a thing. So now young people, you know, maybe have to go into an audition worrying about how many followers they have. There's a, this huge amount of pressures that they're, they're yes, under. Right. Oh my God, I keep forgetting about that. Yes, go on. And I'm like, I, I'm sure you're a good person to ask in terms of a job like Harry Potter, for instance, mm. which is a, which a play, it's a piece of theatre, but it's also this huge other thing, this yeah. huge global phenomenon which people have um, opinions about and feelings That's about. It. And all of that. So I would say, how do you, how do you, how do you navigate and keep your your well being through all of that, which could be potentially quite difficult? Because I think a lot of young actors, a lot of actors who are training now, experience that same thing of of, of how do you deal with the pressures? Absolutely, and it's it's an ongoing process. It's an ongoing learning thing, and that's yes, that's good to kind of re reconnect to the question again. Say during lockdown, what is this thing during lockdown? I have to say, where I am, I can go for a walk around the block. It literally again because I can go and do shopping and then come back. But I literally go in a circle just to get out. And I I know it sounds so simplistic, but even getting out of your way physically going, I have to do that thing today. Let me get, not discipline, but going, what, what do I need? What do I need? Come ask yourself the question, what do I need? Because actually that's, I can't tell you what you need, 
um, but I know what I need and that I'm the only person who I can listen to. I think that's what it is about lockdown, that creativity. Because also what we have to acknowledge, and I really have to acknowledge, is there are, people are in circumstances which this lockdown is making it pay, painful for them to be in because I'm having a great time with my lockdown. I'm loving that I can slow down and be with the girl and we have a laugh and we have a dance and all those things. But there are other people on the opposite side who don't want to do that. So your question goes to back to yourself. You know what you need. I am that way of thinking. Ultimately, you do know what you need. So be honor that. But don't worry about what other people think. That's the problem. Don't worry about what other people think. Yeah. Yeah. Easier said than done, I know, but I promise you it's good. Yeah. Um, here's a question from Matthew. What was it like getting the call to take over rehearsals for Linda at the Royal Court <laughs> <laughs> with only days until opening? How did you prepare? How did you learn it so quickly? For those of you who don't know, Noma, well, you can tell the story. Of what okay. Happened. All right. So I got a call. So, oh, so there's a show at the Royal, uh, at the Royal Court Theatre and my friend Michael Longhurst is directing this show with uh, a wonderful actress um, called Kim Cottrell and they're in the fourth week of rehearsals and a great group of actors and I'm prepping a play that I'm going to be directing following that upstairs at the court called I See You, my first ever directing thing for the um, uh, international department, storytelling department, run by Elise Dodgson at, at that time. God bless you, Elise, rest in peace. And um, I get, I remember, I, why I'm saying this, I remember that week going, oh, I've got to book my ticket for Linda. I get a phone call on a Wednesday evening from Michael. And I remember looking at going, 8.30, that's a strange time to be calling. Hi, Michael, how's it going? Okay, so, um, Kim can't do it she's had to say goodbye and it, she was not well. So it, 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 it was a doctor thing. Um, so we're either gonna close the show or could you come in and read the play? We open next week. What? We open next week. <laughs> okay, well, I've got nothing across Christmas. I've only got that thing to die. <laughs> Need to earn some money. I've got nothing to lose because Vicky Featherstone and Lucy Davis at the Royal Court, alongside Michael Gay, you can have the script in your hand all the time. You can have it all the time. So I go to Michael on a Wednesday evening, look, I can't meet you Thursday and I can't meet you Friday morning, but I'll confirm to you what I'll do it. So he sends me the script again. Now, what you've got to remember is I'd read that script about three, four months before when Michael was experimenting with an idea, possible idea of casting. And at that point, Miss Cottrell wasn't able to be in the room. So he asked me to read the part of Linda it's a reading, it's a workshop, great. 80 pounds in my pocket from the day. Thank you, Amy, who's the casting at the Royal Court. Happy to do that. And this great group of women, um, uh, Mira Sayal, um, uh, Sophie Stanton, um, uh, oh, Imogen Stubbs. I can't remember all, all the names who were in that room, but it was a really lovely idea, which didn't quite work. So we all went for it. We acted out itself. We had a great time. And then that was it, as far as I remember. So I did read Lind Linda at that point. And um, he says, because of what you did at the reading, you'll, me and Penny, skin of the rice, I think you could step into this. I was like, I, literally, I had nothing to lose. What, what I'm trying to say, I had nothing to lose. They're all cool. And Michael said, you've got the script in your hand, go in the script in your hand. I said, yes, I'd do it. I met the company. So Wednesday phone call, met the company Friday afternoon, started blocking. And for me, that was the biggest fear I had. If any of those actors were not happy about me being part of their show at this crisis, chaotic time, excuse me, can I swear? Of course you can. I would have been fucked. And I would have been fucked over here because I'm one of those actors who needs to know that everyone, we're all working towards the same goal. And if someone thinks that you're not good enough, there's a little part of me that just gets a little bit hot and a bit like, oh God, why am I constantly thinking about you? They were amazing. That group of actors was amazing. Then we started blocking the show. Friday afternoon, Saturday all day blocking it. Sunday, day off, uh, Michael and Katie Rudd, um, his associate director come in and give me information about all the work they've done. And on Monday, it's tech. First day of tech on the Monday and Tuesday. And show was due to open on Wednesday. 
luckily they cancelled that show because we've still got a bit more tech to do. My first show is on the Thursday, so less than a week from me arriving on the Friday, on the Friday afternoon to Thursday, we open the show. So people will say, oh, it was about 10 days or whatever. I'm going, no, 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 no. It was literally Friday, Saturday, Tech Monday, Tech Tuesday, Tech Wednesday. We open a show on Thursday. Oh, the sweet baby Jesus. You see, what I, what's, what was making me laugh now? Because when I think about it now, that's when I get hives. That's when yeah. I go, oh my God, I don't believe I did that. But when you're in it, it's like, okay, yeah, yeah. And when you got someone, because it was as Devlin designing the set, Alex now designed the costumes, everyone uh, was working to their maximum effort to get the show on. And that's all you can do. There's no point throwing a hissy diva fit. I think it was a Tuesday on tech. I realized I went, what have I done? What have I, done? <laughs> I, on the set. I had no time to sit and learn the language. So then the art was to let go of the script, to let go of the script. Um, and I think I let go of the script across two weeks, but that was a joy having the script, working with those amazing actors. Um, and then the scariest bit for me was the day that I finally didn't have the script in my hands two weeks later. And then the final two weeks of the show run, I was doing, doing the play. I love that experience. I loved it now, but it's also terrifying. Well, the thing is, the, what I love about that story is that I think it kind of encapsulates what it is to be a professional actor. You have to have part talent. You have to have the talent to be, to be there in the first place. Then the next bit is the opportunity that just comes along. Opportunity. And thank God I worked with Michael. Yes, thank God, because I wouldn't have done it for then, anybody else. Yeah. And then the third part is the bravery to be able to step out on well, that opportunity. It wasn't even bravery. It was like, oh, well, okay. You said, you but you could no. have said no. I could have said no, but there, it was it was this weird sense of, oh no, we've got to do the show. Otherwise it's going to go. Exactly. People have, are going to lose their work. It wasn't, it was a lovely way of not being, it was out of my, um, it was not ego. It was not ego. It was yes. great. Yeah, it was not ego. Yeah. Well, on Are that we here already? But we're, we're here already. I mean, listen, we can go all night, go all night but I think uh, in terms of Zoom, I think, that's, I think we're done. Um, but, and we can always come back again for season two that. or, you know, we can do whatever. I love uh, you, John. Just Herrera. I love you too. Thank you so much. On behalf of our students, um, thank you so much. I know so they were really you. excited. They were so excited that you were going to be here. And I didn't get to ask all their questions. Um, but the answers that you gave were brilliant. Okay, so lovely. thank you so I much. Ramble. I ramble a lot, but you get that's that. fine. Yeah. That's we're in the theatre. That's what we do. And then out of that rambling comes some kind of some gem somewhere. Exactly. Yeah. That's yeah, exactly. You never know what germ, what seed is going to help yeah. someone. Um, so thank you very much. I love stay that. safe. Stay thank well. You. And just to uh, all of you students, wherever you are, please trust yourself more than anything. And I'm saying this for someone who didn't trust themselves when they were younger, trying to get out of this business, always looking out for someone's approval. And it's such a nice feeling when I see young actors who go, no, I'm cool, I'm fine, I'm doing my thing. Because it's about storytelling. That's all we are, we're just storytellers. As simple as that. So on behalf of the rest of our class, we are now going to give you our own seven o'clock <laughs> round of applause. <laughs> <Nova>. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, 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 yeah. Thanks very much for joining us at uh, Mount View Live. Uh, take care of yourselves, stay safe, stay well, and we will see you next week. Bye.